Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. And today for Natural Resources, we are going to continue talking about renewable resources. And so last time we talked about hydropower, geothermal, tidal power. And before that, talked about wind and solar. And now we're going to talk more about continuing with our current setup, so the use of fossil fuels but instead using a different fuel source. So when all the fossils are gone, well, the fossil fuels are gone, all the oil, natural gas, coal, etc., is gone, do we have an alternative? Can we use something else to fill the pump, to fill our vehicles? Okay. Which we're going to talk about biomass fuels now. Okay, <clears throat> so a biomass fuel is based Pure, purely on the same premise as non-renewable resources, except for its current energy. So in other words, it's utilizing plant material for the same purpose that we use ancient plant material or ancient energy in the use of fossil fuels. And so plants capture about 0.1% of all the solar energy coming in. We've already talked about this, and this is why, you know, solar panels and solar energy is, um, you know, on the forefront of energetics, is that plants don't capture very much. But that's enough. That's enough energy to really supply the world's needs, is that 0.1% of the energy. When a plant captures the sunlight, captures the photons, it's going to use those photos, photons for photosynthesis to drive both photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. And in the case of that photosystem situation, they're going to utilize the photons to excite energy, or excite electrons for that matter. And that exciting of electrons will allow for electrons to move and for work to be done, carbohydrates to be made, and ultimately energy to, to go from photon form, wavelength form, to stored energy, either in the form of glucose or cellulose or fructose or sucrose or starches, different types of sugars, carbohydrates, um, all the way to really complex carbohydrates, which are structure molecules. And that's how plants make like new tissue is through these structure molecules. When we look at what is available, what's the possibilities? Okay? Right now, the estimates are 15 to 20 times what we currently use worldwide energy we could get from just biomass of plants. Okay? So 15 to 20 times the energy that we currently use worldwide, we could get that from just utilizing um, different technologies uh, regarding plant biomass and the energy that's stored in plants. So what is the biomass of these plants? Uh, it's the cellulose. It's the stuff that makes the plant rigid or cell walls. So wood, and then you could take that wood and you can chip it down, or you can turn it into sawdust, or um, you know, bark, different things, leaves, the, the actual tissue of the leaf, roots, um, so all the parts of the plant that we're typically not consuming, okay, that is biomass resource. Okay, so when we go through a field, we take the corn off the field, the stalks and all that, that's biomass reserve. Okay. We've known for a long time that we can burn biomass. In fact, all the way really to the 1850s or so, the Industrial Revolution, that's all we burned. That's all we utilized, really, for a huge amount of time to drive work, to um, you know, heat homes, to boil water, to cook food, to you know, do whatever it was, okay? energy, electricity, whatever it was, it was through the use of burning biomass or wood. Okay? So really. In the 1850s, we were at like 90% of the fuel was wood. Okay? 
We then switch to coal, natural gas, oil. Right? But some other countries have not done this. Some other countries still maintain wood as their main um, energy supply or fuel supply. And recently, I guess you could say, in some countries, European countries, it went away in the 1800s. And so people were utilizing you know, natural gas and things like that in the home to heat the home. And now you start to see this influx of wood-burning stoves again. So people have more control over their own um, energy supply. And uh, so that's becoming more popular now. Um, and, you know, it's been around for a long time, the biomass, and so you can utilize uh, coal and wood in the same furnace, same boiler. Um, this, this has been around for a long time. It just depends on the industry, depends on where you're at. Uh, there's been kind of a revitalization of using multiple sources of fuel uh, in the recent times in the United States in case something happens, in case you know you have a shortage of coal or natural gas or oil then you can utilize um, wood to drive the same processes. Alright, so we know that we can burn wood. We've done it for a long time. Now, can we burn wood at the same rate that we used to uh, with 2 billion people? That was what the population was in 1850. It was about 2 billion people, a little bit less actually. Can we then take that and upscale it seven times? Maybe, you know, maybe not quite seven times, but pretty close. Okay, we're almost at 8 billion people, six times. Um, the, the answer is no, we can't. You can't. We don't have enough forest in order for us to cut down and utilize the trees to that rate. It's just not possible. Right. So, yes, we can burn biomass, but there has to be other ways that we can utilize biomass. Right? And one is produce biomass or change biomass from, you know, cellulose into methane, into gas. Okay? And so methane is the main component of natural gas. You know, the gas that a lot of homes in the United States are run on now is natural gas. Um, <clears throat> so we know that methane is a great component. It burns cleaner okay, than oil or coal. Um, and it's, it's much more efficient too. So how do we do it? Well, we can do it anaerobically, um, so without the use of oxygen, uh, by grinding up things like either some type of biomass, so either plant material or you can utilize it in, say, manure and things like that. Um, remember, in the 1800s, maybe you don't know this, but in the 1800s, most homes and in kind of the midwestern part of the United States, uh, even in the 1700s, but um, most of them were heated on what we call like cow pies or, or um, you know, dung, burning of uh, animal excrement. And so what they would do is they'd set up these runs and they'd allow the uh, you know, cattle or horses or pigs, everything, to defecate in these areas and they'd scoop it in and then they'd walk it down, they'd pat it down and then they'd cut it into bricks and they'd burn the bricks of dung after it dried. Okay? And that's really, you know, the way they utilized, especially in the Midwest where you didn't have very many trees, that's what they used to heat their homes was the burning of dung, manure. Well, the problem is, is it's not as efficient to burn off the dung or the manure as it would be as if you could just utilize the decomposition to produce methane. And so that is, you know, a process by which small industries are starting to work on. 
is utilizing, you know, these feedlots and chicken farms and things like that, utilizing the waste from these um, areas to produce methane, to produce gas, and then burn the gas. And so it's kind of a double whammy. You get rid of your waste, right? and you get your waste down to a very nutrient-rich fertilizer that you can then put back out on your fields or whatnot, and you get energy in return. And methane is fairly clean, and it's efficient. Um, and so the other thing is there are different regions, different countries, even part of the United States, um, that are concentrating on maybe this is a good use of our landfills. So our landfills produce about 20% of the methane that goes into the atmosphere. It just comes from landfills. Can we capture that 20%? and burn it off for electricity. There are industries and, and groups of people that are interested in this. And for that matter, there are even colleges that are running their entire campus off of the methane that um, is coming off of landfills. So there are different ways to do this. Um, you can shred up the organic material. This can be, you know, this could be wood fibers. This could be leaves. This could be really anything. It could be already decomposed manure or, you know, uh, defecation from different animals. You grind it up, shred it up, put it in a, you know, slurry with water, right? And then, you know, you just allow for the bacteria, the natural bacteria that is occurring to decompose it. You'll get some liquid that comes off. Uh, that liquid is going to eventually evaporate, produce gas. You can burn the gas, and then the actual sludge or returned material can be utilized to um, spread over fields. Okay? And there's very little waste in the process. It takes time. Um, you know, some of the most recent. Uh, Procedures, most recent setups will take, go from, you know, defecation to gas production in 20 days. Um, so it's not super efficient as you just take it right out of the, out of the ground and utilize it, but um, it's producing a lot less waste and it's a good way to get rid of waste for that matter. So, like I said before, this is starting to be done on feedlots and chicken farms and other things because there's a huge amount of waste and the waste and the energy that's in that waste is more than all the nation's farmers use. So there's going to be a surplus of energy. So when, if you were to convert that cattle waste or that chicken waste over, not only would the rancher or farmer or whatever you want to call them be able to heat and run electricity on their farm for free, they'd also be able to sell energy back to the electrical companies through the grid right, because they're going to overproduce energy. And to show you that this is true, okay, we're going to watch a little video about the Hogchild Dairy in Minnesota, and the fact that you know they are utilizing this system. They have lots of cows. It's a dairy farm. They're utilizing this system to produce, you know, roughly five thousand um, dollars. They're well above five thousand now um, in in electricity every year. Plus, they have no electrical bill, so they're getting rid of all their waste. They're selling energy back into the electrical grid. They're making a profit. And um, in turn, you know, the system is self-sustaining. The entire farm is self-sustaining and is an eco-farm. And, uh, you know, it's highlighted as one of the, you know, one of the eco-friendly operations in the United States. So we're going to watch a little video where they describe how they came about to going through this and you know what other farmers are doing, what other ranchers are doing uh, to 
help with being green. At Hobbin Shield Farms in Princeton, Minnesota, one word describes what's happening inside these dairy barns, innovation. The dairy industry can not only be supplying the food and a healthy product that way, but we can also be supplying the energy. To do that, Dennis Hobbin Shield is taking a dramatic approach to run his farm. The company's mission statement spells it all out to be an environment friendly agriculture business focused on the profitable, progressive, and sustainable production of high quality milk, renewable energy, and related products. We're going to try to be as environmentally sound as possible and still produce high, you know, high producing cows and uh, be both economically and environmentally sound. And that takes the whole farm team. It's not you no know, one individual person, it's the whole team working together that's going to make this work. That team includes Dennis's wife, Marsha, their sons, Brian and Tom, and 34 employees to manage 1,100 dairy cows and farm about 1,200 acres. In 1952, Hobbin Shield's dad, Donald, and mother, Myrtle, moved to Princeton to start a dairy farm. They soon learned that every pitchfork full of cow manure was a precious resource that could revitalize the soil. Dad is being my mentor, basically, is, you know, that uh, we have to be earth neutral. And uh, what we take from, you know, we have to put back. As a young man, Hobbin Shield recognized the untapped potential of biogas production from animal manure. That manure is not a waste, you know. I call it a non-depletable renewable resource that we should be using. Animal manure on our dairy is, you know, has as much value as the milk does. It took two decades of dedication, but in 1999, Dennis became one of the first dairy farmers in the country to install a methane digester. The 21-day cycle processes 20,000 gallons of manure each day, producing 60 cubic feet of gas per minute and generating 120 kilowatts of electricity per hour. Every 100 cows basically are producing equivalent to a barrel of oil a day. So that's substantial. Mother Nature has put that energy there. We just have to take it all out, take it back and recycle that. So we're producing actually more power than we're using and that extra power gets put on, a, is on the grid and it's supplying power for the local neighbors here. But the digester is just the start of the story of innovation at Hobbin Shield Farm. For the past four years, rather than simply burn off the excess biogas not used by the generator, Hobbin Shield has been working with universities from Minnesota and North Dakota to develop hydrogen fuel cell technology. The goal is to find better ways of using this gas. We're running a fuel cell, and the fuel cell process is just, you know, it's a working process, but we're trying to make ammonia out of this excess gas, and that could be used as fertilizer or a future fuel source for fuel cell vehicles. There are only about 150 methane digesters in use by American dairy farmers, and due to the cost, it's limited to larger operations. The recently announced Memorandum of Understanding between USDA and the Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy calls for a cut in greenhouse gas emissions by 25 percent in 10 years. Dennis thinks it could mean additional funding to help smaller dairymen install digesters. It's something that the dairy has to be doing, you know. And, and it's going to, there's no way to even put a dollar value to what it's going to do for the industry because it's, it's tremendous. The U.S. is about 10 years behind in, in Europe on a lot of this renewable energy and, and what can be done. And that's going to hopefully springboard us ahead. And uh, we have the, the technology to, to do you know, twice of what we're doing here on the dairy. It's just, you know, it's going to push us all ahead. I'm really excited. Back to their mission statement, the Hobbin Shields vow to be respected, responsible, and an asset to the community by promoting dairy and renewable energy, welcoming visitors and inquiries from educational institutions. And that's part of our mission statement and vision statement is educating the public. One way of doing that is by providing pregnant dairy cows to the Minnesota State Fair's Miracle of Birth Barn, which features live birthing demonstrations. I mean, I get phone calls daily, basically, when one of the cows are calving down there telling me that, you know, how beautiful that 
calf is, and it's the first time they've ever seen a calf being born. So it's invaluable as far as letting the public know that, you know, the dairy, all the dairy or that portion of the dairy and how it works. So That's a big task during the fair's 12-day run, but one the Hobbin Shields would not pass up as it allows them to connect with consumers now three or four generations removed from the farm and give them a new respect for what happens on the farm. Congratulations to Dennis Hobbenshield, the 2009 Innovative Dairy Farmer of the Year. Okay, so you can see from that video there, uh, you know, it's kind of old, 2009, 2010, um, but still up, you know, still going, still running, and so I'm sure, you know, the price that he's selling to the electrical company goes up every year. It's not like your energy prices are going down in a lot of these regions. They're continuously going up. So if he can sell off, he can make more money, um, recoup his costs, things like that, buy more feed, help with equipment, things, things of that nature. And just to recap, I don't know if you heard, you know, they estimate that every 100 cows produces a barrel of oil every day. I mean, that's huge. We are. We have huge dairy farms in the United States and Canada that need to take advantage of um, these kind of operations because they're burning, you know, a, a easily a barrel of oil a day each one of these farms. So if you can instead utilize your cows so you don't have to um, be drilling and taking those kind of um, resources away from other industries that don't have the opportunity to generate their own methane, uh, it's a win-win. All right, so like I said before, there are a number of colleges, universities that are trying to wean themselves off of fossil fuels. Uh, some have done it completely by renewables, so 100% you know, solar or 100% wind and um, whatnot, but there are a few that are going biofuel systems. So Middlebury College in Vermont is using wood chips to run a gasification plant and heat their campus. Uh, and they're almost 100% uh, renewable. And University of New Hampshire uh, is, they wor they're working on a plan to um, upgrade it. They're currently running a portion of their campus off of the methane that's coming from the nearby landfill, but they're trying to get it completely um, to be renewable from either just the landfill or another source like a, a you know a wood burning uh, place or some wood burning uh, gasification plant or something like that wood chip gasification plant. University of Minnesota, which you know hits home for that region, there is um, completely. 100% uh, renewable, so they use corn stalks and whatnot for their gasification plant, but then they also have a wind turbine that gives them most of their electricity. And so, um, you know, in the end, uh, a lot of these institutions are trying to uh, practice what they preach. They have faculty and individuals that are doing research on uh, biofuels, research on solar, research on wind and things like that, yet, you know, sometimes these institutions, it's just, you know, they're just voicing it. They're not actually doing what they say they need to be doing, and that is you lead by example. And so, like, you know, the, the dairy farm, you know, he says, hey, every dairy farm should do this. He's not saying that because he doesn't want competition because there's not competition in the dairy industry. There's lots of competition in the dairy industry. He's doing that because he wants to see a planet for, you know, his children, his grandchildren and whatnot. Um, and he knows that that's one of the ways that you can do it is by being, um, you know, what we, what we call land neutral or eco neutral. In other words, you have no footprint um, and maybe you're giving back even more than you're taking. All right, so ethanol, um, it's a big one. You know, it's creating alcohol from 
uh, plant material and then utilizing that alcohol for you know a couple different ways. You can mix it with gasoline to produce you know uh, or to uh, cut basically you're cutting your gasoline so you don't have as much fossil fuel and you're utilizing biofuel with the fossil fuel. Brazil's probably the leader in alcohol from biomass, mostly sugar cane. Um, right now, one fifth of the corn that's grown in the United States is going to ethanol production. And this depends on the year and, and the subsidies and whatnot, but pretty much a, a fifth to a quarter um, of all the corn that's grown, all the, you know, is used for ethanol production. There are lots of other crops that are being utilized or at least researched, soybean, rapeseed, sunflower, palm oil. Um, they all can produce you know, a high ethanol or biodiesel fuel. And then there's countries that are leading the way that are trying to switch purely to a biodiesel production. Um, now the problem with a lot of these is instead of digging it out of the ground, you're growing it on top of the ground. And it still is resulting in deforestation, it still results in um, you know, removing habitat and whatnot from animals that are on the landscape. So yes, it might be more ecologically responsible because you know, you're, you're utilizing a carbon sink to run your carbon energy, but nonetheless, you have been removing native habitat to grow either palms or corn or whatnot. Um, so you're not ecological neutral by any means. You're actually destroying um, native habitat, um, and a lot of times this is for economic benefits because you're you're selling this oil off or this biodiesel off and making making a buck. There are new biofuel bio sources, um, some native shrubs and things like that that have been uh, suggested like Gatophopha, Gatropha, Kirkus, um, it's just called Gatropha, um, there's no real common name, but uh, the nice thing about some of these biofuel sources is if you can pick a plant that's abundant but yet, yet not really utilized for a food source or habitat source or things like that, um, in, in the case of Gatrafa, its nuts are not edible, so people don't eat it, but it's highly abundant. And so there's a lot of suggestions of using this it's easily converted to biodiesel, much easier than some of the other food crops. And it's about three times greater than palm oil plantations, but it really depends on the environment that you're growing it in. If you're growing it in some you know, arid environments or the water is not in the same cycle that the plant is, you can have very low yields, much lower than palm oil plantations. And so it really depends. There's a lot of research and a lot of money that's going into biofuel sources. Um, and it depends on the environment. So maybe this is great for Mexico, but it's really not very good for the United States or it's not good for Africa. And so it really just depends on the region for a lot of these situations. <clears throat> so that's why um, other sources of food or other sources of energy have came about and that is to try to get ethanol from things that are not food resources okay so grains like corn and, and soybeans and stuff like that instead of utilizing them to create an energy source why don't we utilize something like grass or wood chips or something that we can't consume which we call cellulistic material. Be and, you know, and, and part of this really comes about is not only do we have an issue in the world with energetic needs, we need energy. Right? We live off of electricity. Right? 
But apart from that, we also need food. And when you're utilizing your food to generate your electricity, you're not getting ahead. All right, so there's a lot of pressure to say, hey, stop using food like corn and soybeans and whatnot and start utilizing some of these other resources to drive your energy networks or your, you know, your energy grid. And we've known about this for a long time because we know that plants utilize photons from the sun to create cellulose and hemicellulose and then all that is is long chains of carbohydrates. This goes back to the biomolecule talk that we talked about a long time ago. Um, just long chains of carbohydrates, which then when you break a bond, energy is released. Well, the longer chains that you have, the more energy that, or more potential for energy there is, and you can take that sugar and convert it into ethanol. Right. And like I said, there's this big shift. Um, it was huge probably five years ago, maybe even ten years ago, to use corn and soybean and now there's this big shift to say okay no more food don't use the food itself but use the stock at which it comes on so like wheat straw take the head of the wheat utilize the head of the wheat for food but take the stubble and use the stubble for ethanol production or take the almond out of the the hole and the husk and use the almond for food but use the husk in the holes for um, you know ethanol production so there's this kind of switch of mindsets and you know this all comes with more research and there's a lot of research recently in creating hybrids so Macanthus giganticus or elephant grass is a combination of two species of grass that has been uh, you know, genetically engineered to produce a biofuel crop. And so with inventions like CRISPR and, and technology like that, we're now utilizing technology to hopefully drive some biofuel production, if that's the route that we want to go. Right? And it's not necessarily the route everyone wants to go. But like this macanthus, this elephant grass, can produce about five times um, the biomass per acre as corn. So you need less land. You don't need to convert as much land to energy. And you can utilize the land that you already have for food production. Right. <clears throat> about to produce about 20%, okay? of the United States gasoline, you would really have to take a quarter of all the U.S. cropland right now, and I already told you we're at about a fifth, okay? and you convert it into ethanol production. So you take a quarter of all the crops and they go to ethanol, and that would get you at about 20 percent of the U.S. gasoline usage. I told you there's no way you're going to get at 100 percent. It's just not possible unless we use some other source, okay? And that's what researchers are working on, like this macanthus, okay? And it's about half the amount of acres. So instead of a quarter, you're using an eighth or a sixteenth in some situations, depending on the environment. It's a different type um, of material, so it doesn't grow as well in certain regions, okay? But it grows really well in other regions where the soils might have been damaged from overproduction and so you have le less need for fertilizer and whatnot. Okay. And so this is a new one that's coming out. Okay. But regardless, it's the same kind of production premise. Okay. You're taking grain or you're taking plant material. You're going to grind it up, you're going to steam it, you're going to release the sugar somehow, either through grinding, milling, or steaming. Okay? Those sugars can then be added to um, kind of a, a brew of bacteria. The bacteria are heated okay, at a certain temperature in which they can break down the sugars. When they break down the sugars, they're going to produce alcohol. That alcohol can be um, 
and go through the distillation process. You can remove the alcohol. Right, and then you're going to add some additives so people don't drink it, but you're going to remove that alcohol and then you can add that alcohol to a gasoline base. So with that in mind, you know, there, the question for a lot of people is, we can do this with algae. And algae can be grown inside a building. Algae can be grown extremely quickly. And algae doesn't need to be grown in the soil. It actually can't be grown in the soil. So it's grown in water. And then you can filter the water and you can return the water and you're not losing the water. So the question for a lot of people is algae the hope for the future? It right now looks like it's a much better biofuel crop than corn, soybean, elephant grass, really any of the ones that have, have been utilized, it's much better. Right? In some situations, right, it's getting about 30 times the biofuel production as elephant grass. Now, even more so, with modern technology, we've seen yields at 80 times the biofuel production. Okay? Now, those are in laboratory situations, controlled experiments, once they get outside, the overall production goes down drastically. Okay? But in facilities, you know, controlled temperature, controlled water flow, controlled everything, right? no pests can get in, it's a sterile environment. Right? 30 is, is easily done, if not higher than that. Now, there are a lot of individuals that say, hey, while we're trying to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels, we could put algae plants or algae biofuel crops right next to our fossil fuel burners. Okay? And so they're going to be picking up the carbon dioxide and create a carbon sink, and then you can utilize the algae to produce oil or biofuel. The other thing is there are lots of species of algae and some of them can produce hydrogen gas and there's the, a new technology out, fairly new technology and that is the hydrogen fuel cells or hydrogen fuel cell cars and so you have kind of two camps. You have one camp that thinks that we should go hydrogen fuel cell cars and another camp that says we should just go purely electric. Um, problem with electric is batteries weigh a lot and so in order to make say a flight so if you're to make an electric airplane in order to make the flight you would have to cut your crew or the amount of people that you could take in half if not more than that okay? uh, with the current technology with a hydrogen fuel cell okay? it, it's like one for one with modern jet fuel it's the same kind of weight, same kind of premise, so you wouldn't have to change anything except for the type of gas that's going into the system. All right, let's watch another little video, another little clip on algae, and um, you be the judge on whether or not, you know, this is going to change the world. We all need fuel to get around, and as America takes steps to improve our energy security, homegrown fuel sources are more important than ever. The Energy Department is researching one of the fuel sources of the future found here in algae. Have a look at this algae farm. These large man-made ponds are called raceways, and they cultivate a new crop of algae every few weeks. You see, algae, or more correctly, microalgae, are very small aquatic organisms that convert sunlight into energy. Some of these algae store energy in the form of natural oils. Under the right conditions, algae can make a lot of oil that can be converted into biofuels. Algae could potentially produce up to 60 times more oil per acre than land-based plants. Extract that oil, and you have the raw materials to make fuel for cars, trucks, trains, and planes. In the future, 
Anything that runs on gasoline and diesel could also use biofuel from algae. The oil is extracted by breaking down the cell structure of the algae. This can be done by using solvents or sound waves. After the oil is extracted, then it is further processed at an integrated biorefinery or, in the future, at a traditional oil refinery. Another great benefit of algae? Consider this. Like plants, algae needs carbon dioxide to grow. And that's good for the environment, since it takes CO2 out of the atmosphere, making it a nearly carbon-neutral fuel source. There may even be opportunities to build algae farms next to power plants that use fossil fuels, actually using CO2 exhaust to feed algae ponds. There are over 100,000 different strains of algae. Some grow better in different climates, or in freshwater, saltwater, or even wastewater. So scientists are testing different algae under many different conditions to find the best strains and develop the most efficient farming practices. While commercial production is still a ways off, algae holds great promise to become a reliable homegrown fuel source to reduce our nation's reliance on foreign oil. Okay, so there you can see, uh, they said, you know, up to 60 times uh, what normal plants can produce on the landscape. Okay, even if it's 30 times, it's a huge deal. Uh, now, recently I've heard some reports that algae, uh, even though it sounds good and initial tests and everything look good, it's probably not going to be the hope for the future because most of the estimates where it comes from how much biofuel is under best case scenario and that when you get them in large raceways and when you get them in areas where there might be competition or areas where um, you know you have limited sunlight for part of the day uh, their their production is much less right? uh, maybe two times what you would get off of your food crops that you currently have. Okay, so it really depends um, on the situation. If we could do this in a laboratory situation and produce enough uh, you know, biofuel that way, then it's probably advantageous to pursue it. But nonetheless, I don't think even if it comes out that it's not going to be the best biofuel, I don't think we should say well, it was a waste of massive amounts of money. Now, there's a lots of universities that are working on algae as a biofuel. But I think what they are finding out is ways to grow algae better. Um, and there are lots of food fish that eat algae. And so if we can grow algae and then feed it to fish, we might be able to uh, supplement our, you know, our need for energetics in the sense of food energetics in a different way from algae. Okay. All right, so with that, um, we're going to end lecture. 